As many of you are likely aware, one of the new books coming out this summer is Spelljammer. Spelljammer confirmed! I mean, technically it's three books and an online supplement, and oh my god, it's gonna be so expensive. But Spelljammer is happening in 5th edition, finally. If you don't know what Spelljammer is, this video is probably gonna raise more questions than it will provide answers for you, but basically all you really need to know is it's D&D in space. Regular viewers of this channel will know one of my favorite parts of checking out any new setting for Dungeons & Dragons is of course looking at all the new monsters that are coming out. And boy oh boy does Spelljammer have some monsters. Right now, only a handful of new creatures have been confirmed either through concept art or the few of them that they've put up on D&D Beyond in an online preview supplement to kind of show off some of the new creatures. Goon Balloon confirmed! So I thought it would be fun to go back and look through the old Spelljammer catalog and share with you the monsters I am most excited to see hopefully make their way into 5th edition. Whether these monsters do actually end up getting reprinted or not, they're all still really cool. So if you're watching this in the future and you already know which of these monsters have come out in Spelljammer and which ones didn't make the cut be the change you want to see. I mean, there's no way they're not going to include the carnivorous plant starfish people, right? So without any further hesitation, here are my top 10 Spelljammer monsters. To get things started here, let's talk about the carnivorous starfish-like plant people. The Artuk managed to be one of the most fascinating races that you can encounter in the world of Spelljammer. They look like five-legged starfish and have one additional appendage that kind of sticks out from the middle of them with their head at the end of it and all their sensory organs. Each one of their other five normal limbs ends in a suction cup that has all kinds of little pseudopods inside of it that functions sort of like fingers. Legally, however, they are plants and they're nearly indistinguishable from any other plant life if they're lying perfectly still amongst a bunch of bushes or shrubberies or what have you. Also, did I mention that they're religious fanatics that crave constant warfare, glory, honor, and destruction? Apparently, their home planet was destroyed by the tyrant race, which is kind of a blanket term used in Spelljammer to refer to beholders and creatures related to them. And as a result, wouldn't you know it, they fucking hate beholders and all beholder kin. But don't worry, they aren't just bigoted towards beholders specifically, they're killing everyone out here. This is partially because they need living hosts to propagate their species. I mean, come on, it's not like these weird plant starfish aliens weren't gonna just have the most horrific life cycle imaginable. They traverse the galaxy, infecting other living creatures with what they call the gift of birth, which in reality is less of a gift and more of an infectious disease that turns all of the meat on the infected creature into jello so that the Artuk seed can thrive and feed on the corpse and eventually grow up into another horrific, weird, racist star fish alien plant person. Something kind of interesting here is that every Artuk is born with the memories of the other Artuk that seeded it and is responsible for its creation, so all of them have some memories which date back to the genesis of their species. They're not exactly a hive mind, but a lot of them definitely have some memories in common, which is kind of neat. God, Spelljammer is just so weird. Speaking of Beholderkin, number 9 on our list is certainly related to the Beholder. The Asterator is a massive asteroid with a singular eye in the center of it that looks a lot like a beholder but without the eye stalks. These creatures are pretty simple. They like to eat, and they especially like to eat sentient creatures, so that's what they do. They're not the smartest, which unfortunately means that almost all other beholders hate them even more than beholders already hate other beholders because they view them as a sort of blight on the beholder reputation for near genius intellect. Oh, they look like asteroids and they eat people. I get the name now. Certainly wasn't because they were eating. Anyways, this penchant for eating stuff and being huge makes them effectively spacefaring treasure vaults. Because if you manage to actually get your hands on one and pillage the contents of its stomach, you're liable to find hundreds of trinkets and treasures that were once owned by creatures the Asterator ate, but are now just kind of sitting in its stomach undigested. This has made them a more sought-after mark for gutsy treasure hunters, but 
Definitely not an easy one. Maybe if it's nice, the bard can get it drunk so it pukes up all the treasure? I don't know. I just think they're neat. At number eight, we have the Ryback, which are essentially malignant little space monkeys. They're small furry creatures with blue or green hair that survive by scavenging and pillaging their way across the cosmos. They're not the smartest either, but they're extremely quick and very stealthy. They often survive by stowing away on spell jamming ships where they might go unnoticed for months, surviving off of scraps of food they can steal without being seen. Once found by the crew of a ship, they may become the ship's new mascot, or more likely, are thrown overboard into the phlogiston. That's like space water. It's not a good time. Something I do really like about them is that they have the ability to enter a trance-like state where they stop breathing, consume no oxygen, and for all intents and purposes, appear to be dead. And they can stay in this state for an infinite amount of time. This reflex also isn't something that they have precise control over. It triggers automatically when they are exposed to toxic or poisonous air, or just a lack of air, or sometimes just in combat when they're near death. So there's lots of room for fun improv with that one. Oh, and in keeping with the theme of Spelljammer creatures reproducing in horrific ways, they reproduce by a process called budding, where a female will grow a few lumps on her back, which eventually erupt into a new swarm of furry little creatures. So if you do have stowaways, you best make sure it doesn't turn into a pack of stowaways who are all budding. God! Technically this is two different creatures, but they're similar enough. They're both dragons, so I stuck them together. It's my list. You're not my dad, you can't tell me what to do. The sun and moon dragons are two of the coolest D&D dragons to ever mark the pages of a book, in my opinion. I like them so much, I actually did a full-on Monster of the Week video about them a couple years back. So if you want a full explanation about these creatures, definitely feel free to go check that out. Otherwise, I'll give you a quick rundown of what I like about them here. They're fucking dragons in space. Sun dragons are inordinately powerful, and their breath weapon is basically just them spitting a small sun at you. And moon dragons have this uncanny ability to control lycanthropes. Just imagine a moon dragon captaining a spell jamming ship throughout the cosmos that is crewed entirely by werewolves and were rats and were tigers and were bears and were whatevers. That's fucking awesome. Their color also rotates from black to white the same way the phases of the moon might, and it doesn't just affect their outward appearance, it also changes their mood and abilities. When they're in their full moon state and their bodies appear completely white, they are super powerful. But they're also entirely off the rock crazy town banana sandwich nutty. When in their new moon phase, their scales appear dark, but they're also much less powerful. However, they are calm, cool, collected, and capable of mapping out advanced plans and using complex tactics. So basically, they're in an endless cycle of planning and scheming, followed by near madness and the power to enact those plans and schemes, which I think is just great. Space dragons! These monsters are so weird. Even calling them monsters feels like a misnomer somehow. While at rest, they sort of look like massive mirrors, which are just kind of reflecting whatever's around them. But they are creatures, and they're very much alive. Sort of. In a lot of ways, they're kind of like an environmental phenomena, but at this point we're just splitting hairs. What does it mean to be truly alive? The fact is, they're giant space mirrors which can be manipulated by a powerful spellcaster to show you pretty much whatever it is you want to see. This includes, but is not limited to, scrying on other creatures, being able to see them from a distance, as well as looking into the past or future of pretty much any other creature you can think of. To the dungeon masters watching right now, don't freak out. There's a part of the entry for this monster that specifies some details it shows might be obscured by imperfections in the Fractine's body, so you kind of have a built-in excuse to not show your players something that you don't want to show them. But if I'm being real, that's coward shit. Show them everything. Show them the whole plot. Let them see if they can do something about it. Also, if the spellcaster who's trying to manipulate the Fractine fails their initial check, 
the Fractine hands them a level of exhaustion for their trouble. And then it becomes aggressive. What does that mean? Well, the Fractine can do all kinds of stuff, which ranges from teleporting you a few feet in one direction or the other, to trapping you inside of itself like Zod at the end of Superman 2. Also, it can only trap one creature at a time. So if something else was already trapped inside of it, that creature is now set free. And any time it takes damage, there is always a 1% chance that it fractures into three smaller versions of itself. There's just so much you can do with this creature. The Radiant Golem is super rad. The artwork straight up looks like an anime villain daring you to approach for a fight. But badass artwork aside, these guys are actually really cool. Unlike most golems, they're sentient, meaning they have fully functioning, intelligent brains and personalities and egos and ids and all that super cool stuff. Such super cool stuff to have. And nobody knows who created them, so they just kind of wander the multiverse looking for friends. But get this, they're not evil tyrants set on dominating everyone with their immense power. Oh yeah, I should probably mention, these guys have immense power. They hit like a fucking shruck and they are very hard to kill. You'd think that would make them natural bad guys, but they're actually pacifists. That's right, in combat they will always choose to run as they abhor violence. If they are backed into a corner and forced to fight, they will if it means preserving their own life, but they will constantly be reminding anyone and everything they're fighting against that this can end any time they want it to as long as their attacker will just walk away. They will almost universally offer mercy to their enemies, and I just think that's kind of neat. Also, they're fucking radioactive. <laughs> they have an ability called Death Aura, which just gradually and inevitably reduces the maximum hit points of every living thing around them until they die. This is actually a massive bummer because these golems are pretty friendly and they want more than anything to just be friends with people. The book literally describes them as being orphans since they don't know their creators and in fact they're responsible for the death of their creators because of this death aura that is attached to them. They'll always readily insert themselves into an adventuring party just trying to make friends but little do they know that they're actually killing everyone around them just by hanging out. It's goddamn tragic. To end on a note from the Spelljammer compendium, all it wants, as it will tell adventurers, is a friend. Do you like Green Lantern? Then you're gonna love the Wiz Shade. Unless you said no, in which case I guess you're gonna hate the Wiz Shade. <laughs> Despite having one of the goofiest names I've ever seen, the Wiz Shade is pretty cool. They appear as somewhat ghostly old wizards in a variety of colors spanning the entire rainbow. The color of the Wiz Shade indicates their rank, with violet being the lowest and red being the highest. They have no physical attacks of which to speak, but they do have one of the most unique mechanics I've seen in a spellcasting monster, maybe ever. At the beginning of their turn, they roll 1d10, and then they get to cast any spell on the wizard's spell list with a level corresponding to the number on the d10 that they rolled, with 10 being a cantrip. For example, if it rolls a 3, it can cast any third level wizard spell it wants, but we all know what spell it would be. Nobody really knows where they come from, but everyone's best guess is that they're a manifestation of the phlogiston's consciousness. They're technicolor space wizards who exist as a form of the universe's collective being. What? What a truly spelljammer ass thing to encounter. Anyway, Flowfiends are one of the most interesting monsters in Spelljammer full stop. And honestly, just by looking at their artwork, I'm as surprised as you are. I'll be the first to admit they look like pretty generic bad guy monsters, but they're actually really interesting. When someone is left to die in the world of Spelljammer, their body tends to just float through space until they run out of oxygen and they suffocate. It's a tale as old as space-time. However, on rare occasions, some malignant entity will reach out to those drifting souls and make sure that they survive. They aren't merely rescued from their death, though. They're reshaped and reborn into something new, into a flow fiend. Flow fiends serve a dark and mysterious master who is only ever referred to as the Great Father. All flow fiends have an undying loyalty to their father and seek only to feed themselves and capture more individuals so that they 
they may be transformed. When the Flow Fiends manage to actually capture somebody, they take them back to one of their grand temples and perform a ritual where the Great Father actually is summoned and shows up in person. Once summoned, the Great Father then exposes the captured victim to his dark magic. There is a high chance that the victim will die during this ritual, but those who survive become flow fiends and join the ranks of the Great Father's legions. And that's all the information we have about this, which is kind of insane. I have so many questions, and all of them get to be answered by the Dungeon Master, which is just great. Have you ever been sitting at the game table and been thinking to yourself, gee, I wish this game was more like Neon Genesis Evangelion? Well, with the Spirit Warrior, that wish can be granted. This monster is a giant insect who has died and had their spirit bonded to its tremendous exoskeleton. Then, a pilot can climb into the small cockpit which has been carved into the exoskeleton and using magic is able to control this entire hulking creature. But it's not so easy that anyone can just pilot one of these things. The spirit warrior, even after death, remains somewhat sentient. This means that its spirit must bond with the would-be pilots, the two of them can work together in perfect harmony. Once the two of them have been successfully bonded, there is virtually no separation between the two entities once the pilot is in the cockpit and has assumed control. There's even a version of this monster that each limb is controlled by a different individual and can be piloted by five to eight creatures, so... Yes, you can play a Voltron campaign in Spelljammer. Voltron confirmed! Coming in at number one is The Great Dreamer. You can't have a Spelljammer campaign without some gorsh dang space whales, and The Great Dreamer is the spaciest, whaliest of them all. These guys are so cool. They're literally just giant space whales, except they have a huge eye on the center of their forehead, or their back. I don't, I don't know whale biology. But they have a mystical third eye, and they travel through a giant sphere of water which they generate around them at all times, allowing them to traverse the cosmos. And this orb of water isn't just a bunch of water they pulled with them when they left the atmosphere of whatever planet they came from. They actually have the ability to open up a permanent portal to the plane of water that's just constantly creating this orb around them, and I think that's so cool. But they're almost never alone. They're typically accompanied by an entourage, the book's words, not mine, of leviathans, as well as the leviathans' attendants, and some other dolphin-esque knights. These massive creatures are so fucking weird, though, and we've only just scratched the surface. Allegedly, they are responsible for all cetacean life, both in space and just in the regular oceans of the world across the multiverse, so I guess we have them to thank for whales and dolphins the world's over. Wait, does that mean that they're responsible for the dolphin delighter? It all makes sense now. Great Dreamer confirmed! But yeah, these giant creatures also emit a constant aura that forces you to make a wisdom saving throw anytime you get close to them, and if you fail it, you're simply just gobsmacked, just awestruck, unable to do anything, until it passes by. This is great for them because the Great Dreamers are completely non-aggressive and they like to think of themselves as sort of guardians of life. Mostly they care for other various species of whales and whale-adjacent creatures, but even if you're a human or whatever, as long as you're chill, they're liable to be friendly to you. Also, a member of their race travels to each planet every 1,000 years to check in with the local Leviathan to see how things are going and catch up on gossip. And I think that's just hilarious. Just imagine one of these giant space whales descending into the ocean to hang out with one of their Leviathan buds, chill out for about a year, and then just fuck off back to space for another millennium. The final bit of spice in the Great Dreamer stew here is that once per year, every Great Dreamer is allowed to bestow the gift of immortality on any one creature they so choose. What? <laughs> 
Excuse me? So I guess those on the quest for immortality now have a new avenue to explore outside of Lichdom, because if you manage to impress the giant space whale, it might stop you from dying. Ever. Anyways, these monsters are all truly incredible, and I hope we see each and every one of them released in some fashion for Spelljammer in 5th edition, even if not all of them make the cut for the first group of books that we see come out this summer. Let me know in the comments if there are any monsters that you think I missed which belong on this list, because if I'm being real with you, there are so many of them, and cutting it down to just 10 was pretty much impossible. In any case, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate you, and I'll catch you in the next video. Until then.